Please rise, call the meeting to order. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Welcome to the November 21st Pulse Falls City Council meeting. We started the meeting out with a workshop on the water master plan. Now entering regular session. Uh, Shannon, please note that all council members are present. And uh, we do have a couple of announcements. Post Falls City Hall and City Business Offices will be closed Thursday, November 23rd and Friday, November 24th in observance of the Thanksgiving holiday. Winterfest 2017 is Friday, December 1st from 6 to 8 p.m. here at City Hall. The evening will include a tree lighting ceremony, crafts for the kids, school choirs, a visit from Santa, and much more. Winterfest is a great way to kick off the holiday season with your family and community friends. The Post Falls Chamber and RCLA alumni are hosting a pajama drive on Friday, December 1st from 4 to 6 p.m. They will be accepting new pajamas and cash donations for the Post Falls Police Department's Victim Services Program. The Chamber's second annual Post Holidays Tiny Tree Festival Brunch and Auction is Saturday, December 2nd from 10 a.m. until 12 p.m. For tickets, call the Post Falls Chamber at 208-773-5016. And we do have a couple presentations tonight. The first one is the State Highway 41 Widening Project. Oops, I've I guess I did. We call all council members here. Okay. I think I missed a step. State Highway 41 widening project and upcoming open house. Lee Bernardi, Idaho Transportation Department. Hello, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, yes, I'm not quite sure how to work this. I don't know if I want to turn this on. Hold on a second. Let's, let's fast forward. Um, so, so for the last year or so, the Department of Transportation has been working on the reconstruction of Highway 41 from Mullen Avenue all the way up to actually Rathdrum. Um, after, you know, we're now in the, in the intermediate design stages and uh, uh, mainly the reason I'm here tonight is I want to invite everybody to our public hearing that we're going to have next week at the Transportation Headquarters there on 600 West Prairie Avenue. And um, it's going to be uh, from 4 to 7. Um, very interested and encourage anybody to show up and look at what we've come up with so far and, and we'll be taking comments, uh, uh, officially recording the comments and trying to incorporate ideas into our concept design and um, just kind of basic uh, what we're looking at is the existing two lane configuration. We are going to reconstruct into four lanes with a multi-use uh, 12 foot wide bike path going up the east side full length. Um, the project will be constructed in two seasons, in 2020 and 2021. We'll try to impact traffic as little as possible. We're going to build the northbound lanes, <clears throat> excuse me, off to the east side of the existing highway, leaving traffic where it's at. So, um, um, other than that, we're, we'll be putting in new traffic signals. We'll be upgrading the signals at, uh, not Mullen, but at 16th pole line. Hope Avenue and Prairie Avenue. And uh, my section of that stretch from Mullen Avenue is up to Rathdrum, excuse me, is from Mullen up to Rathdrum. Uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. From Mullen up to Prairie. There's another design team that's handling from Prairie up to the rest of the way up to Rathdrum. So this hearing that we're having next week uh, will be just for that southern section from Mullen up to Prairie. What was the date again, please? Uh, November 28th, from four to seven. 600 West Prairie Avenue, and that's the ITD headquarters building. Okay. Encourage everybody to attend and, and comment. We'd love to get lots of comments. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you. Appreciate it. Next item is an update on the Arndell uh, Trailer Park water quality update. <coughs> Suzanne? Scheidt Miller. Miller. Yes. Could I ask for some assistance getting my presentation loaded? I sent it to Kit. Yes. Thank 
you. So good evening, um, Mayor Jacobson and City Council members. Thank you for the opportunity to update you on the status of the Arendelle Mobile Home Park. I have prepared a 10-minute presentation uh, summarizing the system status and would welcome your questions when I'm finished with my presentation. To begin, I first became involved with the Arendelle Mobile Home Park water quality concerns in 2010 in response to complaints from residents in the park of discolored water. Results of investigative sampling indicated the well supply in the system was under the direct influence of the Spokane River. The determination of the well's influence by a surface water source is significant as it provides a conduit in, in which microbial pathogens commonly found in surface water can enter the water supply and create a public health concern. The Idaho rules for public drinking water systems require systems to provide treatment for these contaminants, which may include bacteria such as E. coli, viruses, and parasitic protozoa such as Giardia and Cryptosporidium. Can you all hear me so far? Okay. While all of those microbial pathogens present a public health risk, Cryptosporidium is of special concern. The parasite lives outside of its host in what is referred to as an oocyst, consisting of a material called chitin, which is very similar to a human fingernail. I've heard, to go off script for a minute, <laughs> I've heard microbiologists refer to this as a crash test helmet. <laughs> it essentially can live outside the environment of a host for up to a year in an aqueous environment. But once inside, it's, is it inside its mammal's host? The sporozoites emerge and begin multiplying within the epithelial cells of the intestines, causing a disease called cryptosporidiosis. <laughs> And it's commonly referred to as crypto. Perhaps you might have heard of crypto. This photo is an artist's rendering of what the oocyst would look like inside the epithelial cells of the host as the sporozoites are emerging and beginning to um, multiply. Healthy individuals with crypto may not have any symptoms, or they may experience gastrointestinal illness for one to two weeks. Individuals with weakened immune systems, infants, children, and elderly may develop more serious, chronic, and sometimes even fatal illness. The disease is considered highly contagious. The efficacy of pharmaceuticals, um, often this can be treated with a drug called nitazoxidine. Do we have any pharmacists in here? <laughs> Yes, I can help me out. You, it you can you tell uh, it's not my area of expertise. <laughs> However, uh, pharmaceutical drugs can provide a 60 to 75 percent cure rate, but sometimes, like I said, the disease can be fatal. So medical practitioners in our area are required to report incidences of cryptosporidiosis to Panhandle Health District's epidemiologist, and DEQ and, and myself have worked with PhD's <coughs> epidemiologists to study these reports to determine if they may have been derived from waterborne illness. And to date, I'm not aware of any cases of crypto reported from residences in the mobile home park. However, the system remains under a bottled water advisory. But that, in a sense, is, is our primary concern with the well surveying the mobile home park residents at Arendelle. So the system evaluated three options that were approved by DEQ in order to comply with the Idaho Rules for Public Drinking Water Systems. The first was to discontinue use of the well and purchase water through a wholesale connection from a neighboring water purveyor. McGuire Estates, which is to the immediate west of the mobile home park, was approached, as was East Green Acres Irrigation District, which is west of McGuire Estates. Both water systems declined a request to provide water service. And I would like to take this opportunity to, to be very clear that DEQ does not have any regulatory authority to require a water system provide service to another system. That is, that is at the discretion of the water systems solely. The second option was to drill a well within the mobile home park, but there were two primary concerns with that. 
The first being that we would have a high likelihood of that well also being surface water influenced. And the most, uh, the, the least risky spot in the mobile home park to drill the well would have required that one of the mobiles be moved and essentially dislo dislocating someone that lived there. So the third option, which was the selected option by the owner, was to in install an approved filtration system with disinfection. So following DEQ approval of the engineering plans for the system, the treatment was installed. The system consi consisted of two pre-filtration vessels, an absolute one micron cartridge filtration system, and a contact pipeline to achieve adequate disinfection. So conceptually, this treatment system should have provided water that met the requirements of the surface water treatment. So typically, prior to full-scale construction approval, DEQ will approve what we call a, a small-scale pilot study. And we take the water from the well or whatever the source is, and we run it through a very small scale of that treatment system for a full year to make sure it's going to work. In this case, we were all in very much a hurry to get safe water out to these people. So DEQ's engineering program approved what we would call a performance study in full scale. Um, I participated in multiple, often weekly visits to the treatment system once it was constructed. And I met their project engineer, Rob Tate, on site and their licensed operator to work collaboratively with them to try and get this treatment system to function as designed. And unfortunately, despite our best efforts, and we probably had 40 years of experience out there trying to get this system working, um, in May of 2017, the project engineer determined that the treatment would, the performance study would be unsuccessful. So, this is a photo of one of the two pre-filter vessels. And the pre-filter vessels were installed to remove very fine colloidal material that was actually causing the discoloration in the water um, prior to the final cartridge filters. And we had two of those that, that the owner installed. And then the, um, <coughs> the manufacturer of the cartridge system, which you see here, was designed, that was designed to remove the microbial pathogens, such as the Giardia and the crypto that you saw the, the photos of. The manufacturer indicated that if we provided water coming into these cartridge filters at a level of one NTU, that the cartridge filters would work just fine. NTU is just a uh, acronym for a nephilometric turbidity unit, which is a very sciencey word to tell us how we measure the cloudiness of the water. So once we get below five NTU, we can't see that cloudiness with the naked eye any longer. We did successfully achieve that 1.0 NTU going into those filters. However, the filters did not perform as designed. So we went back to the manufacturer um, and the manufacturer said, okay, well, one's not gonna do it. It needs to be 0 0.2 NTU, which we could not realistically achieve. The irony of this to me is that the Idaho rules for public drinking water systems would require the water coming out of those cartridge filters to be a 1.0 NTU in order to be compl in compliance with the turbidity standards. So the manufacturer was asking for an 80% decrease in the NTU levels going into the filters than what was required of the rules. So that's where we are at right now. As far as, as compliance goes, um, DEQ also obviously we have a regulatory role. And DEQ is responsible for uh, regulating drinking water standards set forth in the Safe Drinking Water Act through the state's primacy agreement through the EPA. So currently, the mobile home park owner is operating under a consent order with the DEQ, which requires these following items be met. So quarterly public notification is distributed to water users, reminding them that they should not be drinking the water and that they should be consuming bottled water. The owner is also required to reimburse for the cost of providing the bottled water. The owner is responsible to enter into a written agreement to receive water service by February 5, 2018, and is required to be in compliance with the rules by December 31, 2018. And we hope it's before that. 
So at that point, I'd like to open it up for questions. So the plan right now is that you'll enter into an, into an agreement by February. Yes. You'll have basically 13 months from now to bring that into compliance. What happens if, it, if they don't? There is another stipulation in the compliance or the consent order for the system to pursue treatment, installation of a, a alternate form of treatment. To be honest, Mayor Jacobson, I am not aware of another form of treatment that might be functional out there given the wide range of water quality standards we see from that well. Um, the turbidity levels can range from zero to 50 NTU which far exceeds the other 45 surface water treatment systems that we have pulling from creeks and, and the rivers and the lakes in our area. You mentioned you, there were three possible uh, per water purveyors in the first option. Yes. But you didn't talk about the City of Post Falls. So if the City of Post Falls opts to provide the water, that's a cost that's going to have to be borne by somebody. Is that correct? I, mean, I guess I'm asking Russ that question. Yeah, Please. So if, if nothing else works, now they're, if they're getting bottled drinking water at no cost to themselves, it's not convenient, but it's not costing them. But say all, everything fails and now they have to come back to the city of Post Falls to be the water purveyor. Who's Nickel? Mayor Jacobson, uh, Russ Canole, Public Services Director, members of the council. Essentially, the cost to connect to the city water system would be borne by the owners of the Erndale Trailer Park. Um, we have had meetings with them, and, and we met with them most recently on November 9th. Uh, their engineering firm is in the process of developing a, uh, a design for that water system. We are in support of allowing a connection to the public water system. Uh, that line is on 4th uh, Street and would carry down the Centennial Trail west to the Arendelle Trailer Park. So it is up to to their engineer to design a system that, that meets our requirements, meets local and state code requirements. Uh, they haven't completed that yet, but they are working on that. And our uh, engineering group, our engineering division, as well as uh, our, our uh, John Beecham and, and our utilities group will be in those meetings and will be uh, looking forward to hopefully uh, seeing a design that does meet standard and that, that will allow for this mobile home park and the citizens in the park to be served by water from the city uh, that meets all water quality standards and provide them some safe, safe drinking water. So that, that's our hope. That cost Thanks, would be on them to answer your questions. Okay. And probably a question for Warren. We've had several folks, or we've heard from several folks about the city providing them water. We have to do something to make sure these folks have potable water, or drinkable water. Uh, it's not that it's the city is not willing to do it it's just that there's costs associated with it and I believe what you said Suzanne is that there's nothing there's no enforcement DEQ has no regulatory authority okay. to require a water system serve another water system okay so DEQ is doing what they can do but they have some limitations the city can provide it but there's a cost that's going to have to be paid are we under any obligation or do we run the risk of any litigation or something because we don't just provide it there's always a risk of litigation about everything True. Um, True. <laughs> having said that <laughs> silly me <laughs> having said that the situation we're finding ourselves in right now and russ is correct we've met with the owners of the trailer park they're working with their engineering team to put together a plan that the city staff is in support of i think we're in a position where hopefully in the not too distant future we'll have an approved plan they're funding that that work they'll be funding the work to install the system so I'm hopeful that we will reach a resolution I spoke with the attorney for the owners today he reiterated that that's the plan that they're working on good thank you any other questions no. um, Dan Trend the owner of Arendelle is here this evening and he was hoping to present some documents to you is that possible why not don't think so it's not it's, on. that's not on the agenda so um, but he could present he can always give us the the information and we can circulate okay. it okay. yeah so that would work right. so thank you thank any you other questions much. for me uh, No, and you can provide that information to Shannon and then she'll make sure that we've got it okay thanks Great. Suzanne
Next up, uh, any amendments to the agenda? And I think, Al, you have a request. Yeah, I just requested that, or I would like to request that item N, the 2016 Annual Impact Fee Report, be moved from the consent agenda to new business. We have a second? Second. Motion second. Further discussion? Thank Shannon, you. please take the roll. Morrison? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Henderson? Aye. Borders? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. The motion passes. Thank you. Uh, are there any declarations of conflict? Seeing none, Shelley, would you present the consent calendar, please? Item A is minutes, November 7th, 2017, City Council meeting. Item B is payables October 31st through November 13th, 2017. Item C is the public transit funding agreement with Kootenai County for CityLink. Item D is Montrose 9th edition plat application. Item E is Viking Estates 1st edition subdivision plat application. Item F is final PUD development agreement for the Prairie Falls, Idaho Street development. Item G is change in due date to December 15th, 2017 in contract with Boise State University for recommended benchmarks for city employees per residence. Item H is acceptance of the canvassed November 2017 election results. Item I is Parks Division purchase of a 4500 Toro Groundmaster <coughs> Contour Rotary Motor Mower. Item J is Casa Quartet Subdivision Plat Application. Item K is T2O Subdivision Plat Application. Item L is Whiskey Flats First Edition Subdivision Plat Application. Item M is purchase of a play structure for Tullamore Park for Cascade Rec from Cascade Recreation Incorporated, and item N has been moved to new business, item number B. Any questions? I did entertain a motion. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. <laughs> I do have one question. <laughs> Al's got a question. <laughs> got a question. <laughs> item C, the city land. <clears throat> How much input do we have as a city in what goes on with city link? I mean, do we just write them a check and we don't have much to say about that, or do we have somebody from the city that's can I address that yes sir to be determined that question has come up and if you will allow me we will schedule we have a meeting schedule and I would like to be able to bring that back uh, bring information back to you again at the next meeting that's fine uh, because that's that is a question that's come up and uh, I hate to get into too much until we visit I understand and see what we can do and uh, Warren and I are gonna uh, sit in on a meeting so I can answer the current structure we do Rob Paulus does sit on the committee meetings that where they meet I think monthly or quarterly Rob could speak to that <coughs> so the city does have one staff member and then um, Councillor Borders sits on KMPO for that committee or commission meeting okay that's good and I'll update you if I can too yeah that's cool okay Is that an entertain a motion Move to accept the consent calendar as amended. Second. second. Motion second. Further discussions? Jenna, please take the roll. Malloy? Aye. Henderson? Aye. <coughs> Wolf? Aye. Borders? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Next is public hearings. Tonight we have none. Unfinished business. Tonight we have none. Uh, citizens' issues. This section of the agenda is reserved for citizens wishing to address the council regarding city related issues that are not on the agenda. If anyone cares to address council, come forward, state your name, and we'll allow you five minutes' time. Chief. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Warren Merritt, for the record. Uh, just a couple quick things. Uh, one is to thank the mayor for the presentation today. And then the second piece to that was the um, acknowledgement of the Post Falls police officer uh, for the work that he did with that student. And it was just a great story today. I really appreciated hearing that. And then the last item of business is we're going to do the candy cane run again this year in Post Falls. It's going to be on December 6th. And uh, we'll start about 6 p.m. collecting uh, toys for food, uh, food for the food bank, dollars for Christmas for all, and toys for Toys for Tots. So we'll be out there for a few hours. Good. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council, Bob Flowers. Um, I guess I'm on more of an information hunting trip tonight. Uh, I've attended a couple of meetings in the last few weeks with our neighbor up north, the city of Raftrum. I see a whole lot of building planned and a whole lot of uh, 
homes being, that are going to be built up there in the next year or two. And this kind of made me think that the city of Post Falls is still treating raft rooms wastewater. And I'd like to know uh, who it is that we have that monitors. In other words, uh, do, do we have anybody that monitors the growth up there, not the growth down here, but but with Rafterm, and with that, do we actually annually or semi-annually actually refigure the cost that they pay us so the citizens of Post Falls are not subsidizing Rafterm's growth? I think that information is readily available. Who wants to address that? I thing? can address. Uh, yes, we do, and we meet with them regularly. And uh, Jason does calculate with John Beecham the increase on rate, both on their operating side and their capital <coughs> impact fee side, not capital, or capitalization fee side, and that's sent to them as part of our budget process. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's reviewed annually. Annually. Is there any way to get a copy of those numbers? from somebody at some time in the near future? Yes, um, if you come in and meet with Jason or Russ, either one can get you a copy of the figures. We can also get you a copy of the contract that we have with uh, Rathdrum. Thank you. You're That's welcome. all I ask. Thanks, Bob. Okay. Next item up is new business. First item is engineering services contract with JUB for the upgrade of the Riverside Harbor lift station. Mr. Arbini. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council, Andrew Arbini, Utilities Project Manager. Uh, before we get started, just want to provide a little bit of um, background. Generally, we have in the past included uh, these types of agreements on the consent agenda. Um, we wanted to provide a little more information tonight, so that's why I, am, I will be presenting on the agreement with JUB and for design and uh, construction services for the Riverside Harbor List Station update. So the location of the Riverside Harbor List Station um, is located southeast of Highway 41 and I-90. It's the parcel of property highlighted in blue on the bottom of the screen. That's approximately a three acre parcel, belongs to the Riverside Harbor Homeowners Association right along the north bank of the Spokane River. City of Post Falls has an easement with Riverside Harbor HOA uh, that dates back to 1991 and includes the entire par parcel that you see on the screen. This is a more detailed view of the site. The red circle at the top of the screen is the location of the existing lift station. There's a driveway, an interest off to the left of the screen. You enter and then um, circle around the list station and, and exits up towards the top. There's a limited number of parking spaces and then a <coughs> park space for the residents, and that continues down towards the river. Generally speaking, the updates to the, the lift station would occur in the vicinity of the current lift station and it's our intent that it would all be along that same side of the road in that location. This is a recent picture of the current lift station as it sits. This was constructed approximately 25 years or over 25 years ago. It's an aging facility. It's also identified in our 2012 master plan for receiving an upgrade. The pumps that are currently there, the utility staff has had increasing amounts of maintenance and service to the pumps. Um, there's been issues with odor and noise. So the upgrades would include replacement and then allow for storage. So as I mentioned in the 2012 master's collection system master plan, we would add additional emergency storage um, update the controls, and that would include a control building to house the, 
all the MCCs and the controls, and also include an on-site generator. Also in, adds additional capacity as this area continues to grow. And then in the process, we'd be improving the site access and security of, of the overall site. <coughs> Included in the scope with JUB, we have added a task to analyze an upstream flow scenario that would possibly divert a portion of flow away from Riverside Harbor. That would have a direct impact on reducing construction costs as we would ultimately require a smaller design and structure size. It would also result in long-term operations and maintenance savings as well. Our project timeline that we have lined out with JUB um, generally is as follows. The design would be completed around June of 2018. Following that time, we would evaluate the bidding climate and make a decision whether or not to proceed at, at that time. Um, <coughs> ultimately, completion of the project would be in the year of 2019. Part of this, we have been in contact with the Riverside Harbor Homeowners Association. And a, a great time for construction is summer, and it's also a great time for recreation. And that park is used quite heavily in the summer. And we're being sensitive to those needs and working to accommodate our construction schedule uh, so we can all uh, benefit from, from this process. In the 2018 budget request, we requested $1,324,000 for the combined engineering and construction of the Riverside Harbor upgrade. This agreement is for $308,000, $308,200. We've included a 5% contingency for unforeseen items that would benefit the collection system and ultimately the city. And that would be approved by the public services director. The total amount requested this evening is $323,610. That is the end of my presentation. I am able to answer any questions you may have. Andrew, that's an awfully large number for cons uh, consulting and design, uh, or at least it would appear to me. Are they doing the, will their work uh, centered just on the Riverside Harbor area, or will it expand into other areas as far as the system analysis? This scope is for the Riverside Harbor lift station itself. They will evaluate the, the lift station. Um, as I mentioned, that upstream analysis will we'll take a look at an option of diverting flow, um, but this contract is mainly f for Riverside Harbor lift station. Now, does that lift station service only the, the development of Riverside Harbor, or, does the, or do the boundaries extend beyond that? It, it extends beyond. It collects the development within Riverside Harbor. It also receives flow from another lift station. Part of that analysis will take a look at rerouting a portion of that flow from another lift station in series and routing it to a separate lift station, a more uh, a regional lift station. Any other questions? Thank That's you very much. We need a motion on that tonight. I would move to approve the engineering services contract with JUB for the upgrade of the Riverside Harbor lift station. Second. Motion second for the discussion. Shannon, please take the roll. Wolf? Aye. Borders? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Henderson? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you, Andrew. Next item up under new business is uh, the item, excuse me, that we moved out of the consent calendar. Mr. Wolf, I'm going to turn that over to you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was just uh, looking at the historical fee history since 1999 and the document that I presented is just a breakdown of where we start and have ended the, the overall fund balance and what I guess alarmed me was that we've been collecting this these fees for 18 years on this list anyway and we now have a fund balance of 7.2 million dollars is that combined in all three impact fees yes okay, thank you and especially with like last year, we had 
$2.2 million. I guess my question is, and I, and I know that we're, we collect this money because then we have big projects that come up and we spend it, but then when I look back through the history of it, there's only been four years out of 18 that we've exceeded the amount of money that we collected. Do we have projects out there that are going to eat up this $7 million in the near future or something? I see, I see Dave head. shaking I'm his head. I'm saying <laughs> Dave Everybody's and Russ jump up and, and, <laughs> and uh, Rob all shaking their heads. So okay. start Who right. wants to start? And we can provide you with those master plans that show the projects in which these fees are collected for and, provide, and bring those back here. But the fees do have to be expended out within 11 years per state statute. And so that's one of the reasons why this report is generated is to ensure that from the time it's collected, you have 11 years to expend it out. Now it can still grow because in the last 11 years, last year alone, we collected over $2 million of that 7 million. But when a fee is collected in 1999, that fee has to be expended within 11 years of the date of collection of 1999. But it hasn't been. Yes, it has, yeah. It has? Yes. Okay. So the fee collected in 1999 has to be spent within 11 years. And that, if you look at the balances, oh, they're being just expended down, right? Ex ex expenditures in general. Right. Then. Okay. Right. All right. I guess that was my, I guess I was just bothered by the fact that we had $7.2 million sitting there. And it was kind of like, do we need to reduce the impact fee? Or and I can have individually, Dave can address parks, and then um, Rob, would you be able to address the transportation? Those are the two big ones where we're seeing the buildup is in parks and transportation. The yeah. police department amount is pretty small, right. and that has been expended down. Fair, Council. Um, thank you for this opportunity to kind of go over that. In the parks, there has been a large buildup. Part of it is we recognize that we were working towards uh, getting the sports complex going. We actually, as we run out our CIP, we anticipate in the next three years going through that amount and needing to um, go after grants to supplement it. We've spent about a million dollars this last year in obtaining land, um, both sports complex, uh, additional park land. Uh, this year we're working on uh, increasing the capacity at Sportsman Park we're going into the Tullamore development that was 700 and some thousand dollars. We have between five, 600,000 on the Crown Point. With the sports <coughs> complex, we are looking at that development being about 1.6 million. We also have some road improvements in there. Um, so, okay. well, we have the money now. I think we're going to go through it faster than I am comfortable, but. That's reality. We, had, we go into pl plateaus. We build up, we get our work done, kind of build up again. And so. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Rob, you want to address streets? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Robert Paul is assistant city engineer. Uh, in the transportation area, over the last year, we actually have not sp spent quite as much towards project development and construction as we normally would have. Uh, the reason for that is we are in the final stages of updating our transportation master plan and we wanted to make sure that we were moving into projects that the new master plan was identifying. Um, over the next year we actually still have some outstanding um, bills with the 7th Avenue project. We have a little bit of monies that we will be doing some improvements which are from our capital improvement plan at the Spokane Street Railroad Crossing, the Grange Avenue Rail Crossing. We've got some grant projects that we are looking at, well, that we've been granted and we'll have some match dollars on for traffic signalization along Celtis Way at um, Henry Street, at Celtis and Compton, and then at Mullen and Spokane Street. We're also anticipating and hoping that once we adopt our transportation master plan, one of the first projects we would like to start moving forward on is the potential traffic signalization or a roundabout at the intersection of 4th Avenue and Celtis Way at the uh, I-90 on-ramps. Um, we've also taken some preliminary looks at the next five years and trying to balance the revenues coming in with what budget we have so that we're not expanding all those dollars right away in the five-year time frame. Two million dollars in revenues and transportation doesn't go very far when a traffic signal costs so around a half million dollars to begin with. When you look at a mile's worth of road, 
you can spend a couple million dollars to build a mile's worth of road. Usually we focus on intersections because that's the most bang for our buck in traffic safety and moving traffic. Does that answer your question sufficiently, yep. Councilman Wolf? Very good. Thanks, Rob. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dave. Next item up is administrative. Uh, no, we have an ordinance. ordinance. We ordinance. have to make a motion on. They don't have to do anything with it, do they? Oh, yeah. I, it, was it, on, it was on the consent, consent calendar, calendar for approval. Yes. So Thank you. I would intend. They're essentially a, a acknowledging receipt, yep. approving acknowledging the report. Receipt, yeah. I would uh, entertain a motion. I would move to approve the 216 annual impact fee report. Second. Motion second. Further discussion. Shannon, please take the roll. Wilhelm? Aye. Borders? Aye. Henderson? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, ordinance, we do have the Runcorn run easement vacation. Move to place the ordinance Runcorn easement vacation file number VAC-17-04 on its first and only reading by title only while under suspension of the rules. Second. Motion second. Discussion? Champ, take the roll. Wilhelm? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Borders? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Motion passes. An ordinance of the City of Post Falls and Municipal Corporation of Idaho mm. providing for the vacation of easement <coughs> in the southeast quarter of Section 28, Township 51 North, Range 5 West, Boise Meridian as described herein, providing for disposition of the vacated easement, providing repeal of conflicting ordinances, providing severability, providing an effective date, and providing for other matters properly relating hereto. Move to approve the ordinance run corn easement vacation file number VAC-17-04 and to direct the clerk to assign the appropriate number and that it be published by summary only. Second. Motion second. Discussion? <coughs> Shannon, please take the roll. Borders? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Henderson? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Now, administrative staff reports, and the discussion is do we hold a second meeting in December on December 19th? Do we need it? We checked with, uh, or I should say, Shannon checked with um, the community development, and there is nothing coming forward out of PNZ Commission for that particular date. So there's nothing pressing? No. Council? Move to cancel the December 19th council meeting. Second. Motion second for the discussion. Take the roll. Thorson? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Henderson? Aye. Borders? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Motion passes. And if something were to come up, we could always hold a special meeting. We uh, can, yes. Proper notification, so. Uh, thank you. Next up, uh, Mayor Comments. I have a question, Chief and Chief. Uh, holidays for Heroes going to kick off? I mean, we're, we're fast approaching December. What kind of time frame are we looking at to kick off? Mayor, thank you for bringing that up, Council. Um, Holidays and Heroes is December 10th, which is a Sunday, and we've already kicked that off, and we're uh, in the process right now of accepting donations and working with the schools to select the names of the children that will be uh, shopping with us on December 10th. So we're in full swing right now. Good. And uh, are you getting that out so donations will come forward? Yeah, we've already got a press release that's, uh, that's gone out. It's on our website. So anyone that's interested in donating being part of that, visit us at postfallspolice.com. <coughs> we've also had uh, a couple of occasions where we've had staff on Channel 6 and Channel 2 news in the morning announcing that program, and it's uh, been very successful. Good. Thank you very much. <coughs> Council comments? I got nothing. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, we do not need an executive session? Nope. So the next meeting, the uh, next motion is adjourned. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting adjourned. Thank you very much and have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank